Hello, and welcome to the Coin Stories podcast, where we get to explore the future of money, business, technology, and Bitcoin's revolutionary promise to boost economic prosperity around the world. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm here to learn with you. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of the discussions should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. Please make sure you're subscribed to the show and hit that notifications button so you never miss out on any new episodes. This show is made possible and the content is free thanks to partnerships with companies I trust. And I'm very picky about who I choose to partner with. So I hope you take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. Thanks for joining me. And if you're watching this on YouTube and want to see more videos like it, make sure to hit that like button. All right, it's time for the show. Welcome back to Coin Stories. All right, once a month, I am talking to Bitcoiners from around the world about their Bitcoin journey and their journey really with fiat. And this month, I'm excited to be talking to Amnon Meltzer. He's joining us from Cape Town, South Africa. Amnon, thank you so much for joining me. Nice to be here. Well, you have a fascinating story, so let's get right into it. And first, tell us a little bit about your life. I know you're born and raised in South Africa. Tell us what might have gotten you so interested in studying money and eventually Bitcoin. Um, well, I actually got in, into it. I studied uh, maths and stats at university, and I did a course on cryptography. So that was actually my entry into Bitcoin, because I was always interested in cryptography and the public-private key. I learned about it a long time ago, and I've always been interested. And then when I heard there was a currency based on cryptography, I, I just had to learn more. And then once you once you started, you, you never really end learning about Bitcoin. Yeah, I was really fascinated to read that you studied cryptography in the 90s at university. And then a friend told you about Bitcoin. And so you bought your first one in 2015. It was about 240 US dollars and what, like 3,600 uh, South African Rand, is that right? Correct. That was a, I should have bought more. <laughs> <laughs> and you said you went on yeah. Mt. Gox. What happened there? Yeah, no, so I just, uh, my very first email that actually mentions the word Bitcoin was all the way from Mt. Gox in April 2013. So I had an account there. I didn't have any funds there. I couldn't get, it's, it's quite difficult to get funds out of South Africa. I couldn't get any funds there, but I do have. <laughs> an email from Mount Gox saying that I was welcome to join, which I'm very pleased I didn't. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I want to learn more just about South Africa because some of my listeners might be familiar with some of the issues that the country has had with inflation, with the IMF. So can you talk a little bit about what has living with fiat in South Africa been like and why is that a country that's maybe primed for Bitcoin? Um, well, the Reserve Bank here has its target range of 3 to 6%, which is, you know, a lot of the European and Americas, they go for 2%. But here we go for 3 to 6% for some reason. And it's usually been on the high end of that and often well over that. So the rand relative to the dollar, it just gets worse and worse and worse. I mean, just at the beginning of this year, for example, it was 17 rand to the dollar. And now it's 19 rand to the dollar. And that's just in eight or nine months. Um, and I remember a few years ago when it went over 10 rand to the dollar. And just a few years before that, it was 5 rand to the dollar. So, um, you know, we've really it's averaged out. I'm not sure exactly, but it's on the high range of high end of that 3 to 6% range. And, you know, so a lot, of, a lot of people do their best to, you know, to somehow immunize themselves against that. Well, and you mentioned that it's, you know, there are capital controls, right? And so it's hard to basically get money in and out. Can you talk a little bit more about that and and what that problem is that Bitcoin can essentially solve for a lot of people? Okay, so I'm, I'm like the financial director of, of a few small entities and I do a lot of international payments and there are capital controls. So, so every single outflow or inflow of money gets like scrutinized left, right and center. So when we have to pay a supplier, you know, we've got to have, we've got to show the reserve bank, the contract, we have to have the invoice, which is got to be exactly matching everything in the contract. We've got to show that the goods actually did arrive in the country with all the import documents. And if it's an electronic deliverable, you know, if we have a consultant that's done some work for us, we actually have to show the contract between us and the consultant. And sometimes we have to actually show the report that the consultant did just to convince the you know the reserve bank that it is a real transaction and we're not just getting money out for no good reason 
Um, so while it's not, it's, it's not particularly difficult, it's just very time consuming and energy consuming and something somewhere doesn't match up and you have to start all over from the beginning. But um, it's, it's not like other countries where it's just one internet transaction and it's done. This is, you know, it takes days and it can be about 500 Rand. What's that? You know, that's like you know, $30 just to do, you know, just to get the transaction going. Never mind what the banks take from it. Um, individuals can take, can take money out up to a certain limit beyond which you have to have a tax audit and a all sorts of difficult things. So it, it is possible to get money out, but it's just, there's lots of friction. A tax audit. Wow. Yeah. I mean, until I learned about Bitcoin, I didn't realize, you know, how long it takes for final settlement, how many middlemen there are. They all take a cut. And really, when you when you layer on top of that foreign currencies, I believe it was Saifedean in the Bitcoin standard who talked about how many trillions of dollars every single day uh, is just spent on transferring currencies. I mean, it's essentially an industry that has no productive value for society. It's just exchanging one currency for another. But that's the world we live in since we're not all on one standard, right? So um, I know that you've been collecting money. And one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk to Amnon is he sent me photographs of this wall in his house. And his kids call it the wall of worry. It has all these different currencies, many of which have hyperinflated, right? Um, so Amnon, tell me about a little bit about that and you also collect coins right so you have your hard money and and your soft money as well yes so so once you learn about bitcoin and the hard money properties of it then i wanted to get a gold coin i think every bitcoin has got a soft spot for gold gold 1.0 bitcoin's gold 2.0 so i acquired a gold coin i've got so for example i've got a gold coin here okay and then i thought why well, stop at gold why not get silver? I mean, silver is also, I mean, it goes back to biblical times, silver. So I, I got a silver coin. And then I said, why well, stop there? I mean, while I'm getting metals, let's just go wild. You know, so I got, I've got some copper, got some tin, <laughs> got some brass, which is not really an element. It's a, it's a, and then there's nickel. I can go in the whole day and I've got zinc wow. and I've got <laughs> niobium. I've got, he has a, he has some, pure carbon wow aluminium and this is also one ounce everything i'm showing you is one ounce and it goes on it goes on it goes on i can show you more i've got some uh, sulfur and then uh, i've got the block of titanium anyway so i thought while i'm getting all these metals on the hard money side why don't i just go for the soft money side as well so i started collecting banknotes for countries that have gone through some kind of hyperinflation. And it's been a very interesting journey, A, acquiring them, and B, getting them into the country is also was quite a trick. Um, but I, I can show you some if you want. I don't know how we, if you want. So for example, I've got a whole row of them on the wall. Like here, for example, is 100,000 Russian rubles from 1921. Wow. Okay, and, and it's, it's quite interesting, although it was a lot of fun collecting, I mean, I think each one of these notes has a very sad story behind it, you know, I think a lot of people right. went through a lot of hardship, particularly this one, this one is, it's a hundred billion German March, billion? 1923. Wow. Yeah. For, for, I, I know a lot of people who watch the show or listen to the show have read When Money Dies and it's just, yes. that's fascinating. So you, you do you source these on like eBay? Where do you get these? Yeah. So they, they are dealers of, of notes and coins, which have them. And then they are on eBay as well. You can get everything on eBay. A lot of these, these um, yeah. the metals came from eBay and all the notes are coming from eBay as well. Each, each one of these things, you know, they've got their own history. I mean, this this German yeah. one, I mean, this is this, this hundred billion dollars. I mean, the financial chaos in the 1920s is what got Hitler into power, you know, right. and, and so I've got more, I've got a much bigger one. I mean, here we've got, this is from after the war. So this is Hungary. That's oh, a wow. big number. I don't know if you can see it. One milliard. Wow. Well, yeah, so it's, it's a million, it's, it's, it's a million, it's a billion millipango. So it's a billion million wow. pangos, which has got a lot of zeros. And I've got... <laughs> You know, here's another one from Poland. I know, I know you, you, oh, your origins are from Poland. So this, yes. in, uh, in 1990, they weren't having a lot of fun there. I've got some African ones. 
Yeah, that's a very interesting one. This is Zimbabwe. One hundred billion dollars. But it actually says on it. Um, let me read it. On or before thirty first of December two thousand and eight. So it's a banknote that expires. How's that? Wow! Yeah. Wow! Okay, that so together. that's that's interesting. I yeah. mean, we talk a lot about pro programmable money and the idea that CBDCs might expire, but it was actually on these physical banknotes as well. Do you do you Correct. have an Argentine peso as well? Um, I do. I don't have it right here, but I do have it. I've got I've got some more Zimbabwean ones. She has a hundred trillion. Oh, wow. Yep. I've, I've seen that one. You know, yeah. it's, it's so fascinating. I don't know if you followed the election, but yeah. uh, Javier Malay, who's the pro pro Bitcoin presidential candidate. There was an election on Sunday. A lot of people thought that Javier, you know, would would take it and, and move forward right away as as president. But instead, he's forcing a runoff because the person who actually got more votes over the weekend is the current economy minister. And you just have to wonder, I mean, in a place with over 100% inflation, I believe they have 138% year over year, they're going to put in the guy who's in charge of the economy. I mean, what's your reaction to that? It's bizarre. Yes, I was also hoping that he was going to just get through on Sunday. Um, so I was a bit disappointed to wake up to find out he didn't. But um, it is bizarre. But I mean, politics is bizarre altogether. So, I mean, you don't actually expect anything rational to come out of politics, to be honest. No, that's, that's well view. said. Not that well, I'm following it closely at all. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners. First up, Bitcoin Conference 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin event, is coming to Nashville next year. Come join us for three full days of keynotes, panels, networking events, workshops, concerts, and more. My first ever Bitcoin conference was back in 2021, and that's where I dropped my first episodes of Coin Stories, not expecting this to become my full-time job, just hoping to meet Bitcoiners and find more guests for the show. Anything can happen here, especially if you dream of working in the industry. Ticket prices go up every month until the big event. So don't miss out. You want to get your tickets early. And for 10% off, use the code HODL, H-O-D-L at B tc slash conference. I'll see you in Nashville. Next up, Fold. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to groceries to your Bitcoin conference ticket with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can play to win free Satoshis or even a whole Bitcoin by spinning the rewards wheel. This is a great app to get someone totally new to Bitcoin and way better than earning reward miles and points. Head to foldapp.com slash Natalie. And if you use my link, you'll get 10,000 sats when you sign up for Spin or Spin Plus and spend at least $20 on the card. All right, back to the show. One thing that um, I, I love that you you shared with me when we were exchanging emails is that you are teaching your kids about all of this. So they they see these notes on your wall. They know what it means. They know the warning. And you also pay them in Satoshi. So tell us about that. Yeah. So so this wall is it's very prominent in our house. So every visitor that comes to our house stops and looks. They've never seen anything like it before. And it's a great opportunity to teach the kids about money. You know, they, they, they all know their own local rands and they've all heard of dollars and they kind of know a little bit about that, but they've never seen big numbers before on banknotes. And it's a wonderful opportunity to teach people, you know, so you're not giving them a lecture and you're not, you're not forcing it on them. They're actually asking questions about why and how did this possibly happen? And each one has, has its own story. You know, not that I'm a historian and I don't really understand each one, but I do understand the common theme of why it happens in the first place. We'll share a little bit more about that. What, what lesson do you want the people who visit as well as your children to get from yeah. seeing, from seeing that? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I tell them that I think all currencies are going through hyperinflation, just at a slightly different pace. So these are the ones that have done it quickly and the Rand certainly at some stage, I mean, it's just getting more and more all the time. And the dollar will eventually as well, I think, Natalie. I don't know. What do you think? I agree. Oh, I mean, we're, we're, we're probably going to be the last, right? Because we've had the privilege of being the global reserve currency and it's so entrenched in our, our global system. But obviously, it's on the way there because we've, we've really taken advantage of that position and printed too much money and gone too far into debt. Yeah. So I actually haven't put the dollar on that list on the wall yet, but uh, maybe one day. 
yeah. maybe one day. Another thing that I've done, which which is on the wall as well, is I've created my own inflation basket. So I went to the to the store with my kids, and we bought all the stuff that they like. So there's cornflakes, and there's chocolate, and there's um, all stuff which I think is going to be there for a while. And every month we go to the shop and we buy the exact same brands, the exact same basket, and we're plotting the the rate of inflation in South Africa. And it's, it's like very real for the kids, you know, wow. doing your own inflation index. And so what's so it telling you? Well, South Africa, we're from 1 January, so that's when we started. We're 8.6% up on our basket in one, so that's wow. what, nine, 10 months now. That's fascinating. You know, I think maybe parents should do that here um, because we're being told one thing. I feel like we're constantly being gaslit by the officials and the media saying inflation's coming down. You know, look at Paul Krugman and his tweets. Right. And yeah. uh, and yet and yet, you know, who are you going to believe them or your own lying eyes? Like what you're seeing something, you're feeling something different in reality. And yet so many people doubt it. Uh, I know that you spend Bitcoin, right? There's a local grocery store that accepts Bitcoin um, that you go to. Can you talk a little bit about um, just, you know, how much people are actually using Bitcoin in <laughs> your in your country or in your local community? And also, why do you spend your Bitcoin? Because a lot of people just want to, you know, hoard it, save it for the future. Um, okay, so two things. I am involved in some e-commerce websites, which all accept Bitcoin and it's a handful of them every week. So people do spend their Bitcoin on, on our websites. And um, there's a big retail chain called Pick and Pay, which is, you know, they have, uh, I don't know, several hundred outlets and they're a full, you know, a bit like Walmart, but a bit smaller, um, <clears throat> which accepts Bitcoin on the Lightning Network at the toll. It's quite amazing. I'm not quite sure why they did that, but it's fantastic. So you can actually, there is an app that you, you do download on your phone, which interfaces between your Moon wallet or your Phoenix wallet or whatever, or your Blue wallet, whatever wallet you have on your phone. Um, but you get to the toll, they ring it up, you say you want to play by QR code, you get a QR code on a little terminal and you scan that in, and you, you press send and you've just spent a few Satoshis and it, it's fantastic. Um, why do I do it? I just do it for the thrill of spending Bitcoin. I'm, an, I'm a buyer and only a buyer. I'm not selling for a long time, but I'll spend a few rand, a few dollars here and there to buy stuff just, just for the novelty of it. I honest. love it. But it actually well, is amazing that, that, it, that, a, that a national retail store mm -hmm. can accept Bitcoins on the Lightning Network and it, it just works. It really is fantastic. Why, why does South Africa specifically need Bitcoin? Why would it be great if your country, more and more people adopted it? I don't think we're all that different from other countries. I think there are a lot of, um, uh, you, know, you know, people from other countries, from Zimbabwe and Mozambique and the DRC that come to seek their fortune in, in South Africa. And they do a lot of remittances back home. So I know, for example, a year ago, we had a guy who was um, cleaning our pool. He was our pool guy. He organized everything about our pool. And he was a refugee from Zimbabwe. And he didn't have a bank account. And, and we always used to pay him cash. And I said, can I pay you in Bitcoin? And he said, yes, absolutely. He knew exactly what I was talking about. So, so from that date onwards, I always paid him, you know, when he came every week, by Bitcoin, and, I, and I'm convinced that by the time he was walking down the road to his next job, he'd already sent those Bitcoins home to to his, his family in Zimbabwe. I'm wow. sure he was, even before he was off our property, those, the Satoshis were already in Zimbabwe. Wow. So I, I do think there's a, there's a need for it for the remittances, because um, it's very expensive just to do, um, to do remittances from South Africa to other African countries. I mean, I just looked at some of the reports, you know, it's upwards of 5%, you know, as high as 13% even to get your money out. So if you could do it on the Lightning Network, which is essentially free and instant, mm -hmm. I mean, why wouldn't you? Yeah. And, and a lot of those Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans in this country, they all know about Bitcoin. You don't have to oh, explain sure. it. You meet the Zimbabwean, uh, even on the wall of warning, one of the guys that came and installed it um, was from Zimbabwe. Yeah, and he he actually had some of these notes. He remembers them from when he was a child. And 
when I mentioned Bitcoin, he knew exactly what I was talking about. So oh, yeah, I bet. the word is out. The word is definitely out. I bet. You know, I saw a great movie called Lecker Feeling, which focuses on Bitcoin adoption in South Africa. Aubrey Strobel was one of the people that uh, produced it. And, you know, it's, it really is inspiring when you see this movement because Bitcoin is global and it is borderless. And although we do need it here in the U.S., there are so many other places where I think people need it even more and even you know sooner. So it's really exciting to see. Um, I know that you have your cryptography background, right? So I, you appreciated more of the technical components of Bitcoin. But can you talk a little bit about maybe what was what was your journey of education? Did you I mean, was it immediate for you because you knew the the tech behind it and the computer science aspect of Bitcoin? Or did it take you still a while to think that this could actually work? I can actually trust this. This is something that could could serve as a global you know, currency or global reserve asset. What was that process like for you? It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, CoinKite. CoinKite offers everything you need to safely self-custody your Bitcoin. CoinKite produces the cold card wallet, which is the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code, it's ultra secure, and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes to find all their custody products, cold cards in different colors, seed phrase plates, tap signers, block clocks, and more. And get a 5% discount using my link. Become your own bank with Bitcoin and CoinKite. Next up, CrowdHealth, my alternative to fiat health insurance, which is just way too expensive. Think about it. You send that money every single month to a massive corporation and you never see it again, even if you don't get sick. And if you do need a doctor, sometimes you have to pay even more out of pocket. Luckily, there's another option and it's all about community. CrowdHealth brings together Bitcoiners who crowdfund each other's health care. So you no longer have to pay fiat health insurance companies. You get to help other Bitcoiners and they help you in return. So how it works is when someone needs a doctor or hospital visit, CrowdHealth negotiates down the medical bill lower than what insurance would be and the community helps you fund the costs. You get to save the money you would have sent to insurance and hey, why not put it into Bitcoin? I'm so glad I made the switch to be part of this community and now I spend only about $100 a month on healthcare. Head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie for more information. I'm excited to share that I am now an advisor for the Orange Pill app. If you haven't downloaded it yet, then you're missing out on connecting to Bitcoiners in your area. The Orange Pill app is focused on building the social layer for Bitcoin and helping create opportunities for in-person connections and community building. You create a profile and you'll see lots of familiar faces, and then you can search for Bitcoiners and Bitcoin events based on your location. I'm geotagged in my home base, St. Louis, and I'm so grateful I've been able to meet new Bitcoiners thanks to OPA. If you want to sign up, head to the referral link in my show notes. What was that process like for you? Yeah, well, at first it was just a lot of fun, just... You know, I had some friends who were in the same space and, and we were just transferring coins around just because it was it was just cool and novel. And then it dawns on you that this is not just the latest toy or the latest app. This is something a lot more revolutionary than just, you know, something to have fun with. You know, and then you read some of the, you know, the, the, the canon, you, you know, Saifedean's books, the Bitcoin Standard and you, some of the others, and, and you start realizing were, you know, like I've stumbled onto something much bigger than I ever thought it was. Um, and uh, I have had a lot of difficulty like, with my friends, you know, people in my position, my peers, you know, to say, you know, maybe you should invest. I mean, you've got nothing to lose. It's a bit of a one way, you know, either it's going to go to zero or it's going to go right. to the other end of the scale, you know, and it's like, you know, so don't put all your life savings and just come along for the ride, you know, it's going to be a roller coaster, but at least be on the on the roller coaster. Um, so I have convinced some people, but but not not as much as I thought I, I could, to be honest. I, I relate to that. I mean, what what's the pushback that you see when you when you interact with your friends and people within your community, and you're trying to get them to understand what what's the holdup for them? Well, I think that you know, when you mention the word Bitcoin, the first thing people think of is money launderers and tax evaders and financing terrorism. You know, Bitcoin's got that image out there, which I think we all mm -hmm. need to try and change. Yeah. Um, and then I think also people think, you know, the system works for me. You know, like I've got a bank account. I've never been censored. You know, I've never had anything taken away. And, I, you know, mm -hmm. so, and I even got pushback once where, where a friend of mine said, 
you know, because of this whole self-custody business, you know, that you actually hold the coins yourself. You're not relying on a bank or another institution. He says, Let's, isn't that going backwards? You know, it's like in the old days, you used to have your gold under the bed. You know, now we don't want to go back to that. And I said, we actually do want to go back to that. You know? So, well, yeah, so what's your, response, what's your response to them after all of your years of really um, studying money and seeing the impacts of what a centralized uh, system looks like and, and what the fallout could be from printing money and going further into debt and devaluing people's savings. What is your message for people? Why do you think that this is so important for everyone to learn about? Well, I think in this country, there is an election coming up in 2024 next year. Um, and it's going to be a very interesting one because the ANC, which has been in power from 1994, so that's 30 years now, this is the first election where they might not get their 50%. So this is a liberation movement that used to have 60 something percent and every year they get less and less and less. And this year or next year, it could be a, um, you know, they might need a coalition partner, the, you know, they might not get their 50% and who wow. knows what's going to happen. I mean, this is a lot more unstable country than, than the US. I know the US is in a bit of a mess at the moment, but yeah. I think we're in more of a mess. and. You know, and I, I say to, to people, you know, what happens if, you know, if, if this country goes up in smoke? I mean, the chances of that are not zero. You know, do you really want your money in a bank when that happens? And also because I'm very involved in the Jewish community in South Africa. And there's a lot of anti-Semitism here. And now with the Israel-Hamas war, there's a lot of fear and a lot of, um, I mean, the Hamas flags in, in driving around all the time, you know, people have a big Hamas flag out of their car. And I'm saying to people, you know, like the chances of, of us having to leave in a hurry is not zero. I mean, it is small, but it is, it, it's not zero. And, you know, that's, that's part of the reason why I have Bitcoin and I hold it myself is, is, you know, the future is uncertain. And a lot more so than in the US. I mean, the US has got a crazy election coming up and got crazy debt problems and all that kind of stuff. But we're, uh, you know, this country also has that. Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly with the election of a, you know, the, the biggest party getting less than 50%, you know, are they going to just hand over power nicely? I mean, right. who knows? And it's far from obvious, you know? Right. Well, you bring up some really good points. There's so much uncertainty ahead, especially with all the geopolitical tensions. Bitcoin for so many people has become an insurance policy and you don't necessarily have to put your whole life savings into it, but to just have a little to know that if something were to go wrong, if there were to be seizures or you need to flee at a moment's notice, it's so critical that we have this kind of technology really for the first time in history. And as far as, you know, these wars breaking out, it's always the innocent people who suffer, right? Not the ones that are deciding to go to war, not the extremists. Those are the, the people in power and the extremist groups represent, I think, a very small percentage of, of the true population of just people who want to work hard and be good to their neighbors and just, you know, make money that, they, that, that doesn't lose value. So it's really sad to see everything that goes on in the world around us in every country. And Bitcoin provides us with that sense of hope. Is that is that how you see it, especially when looking towards the world that your children will live in? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the number of fiat currencies is going to get less and less and less and less. I mean, I think the US dollar will be the last one standing. But I mean, already, you know, people are talking about Argentina. Yeah. And um, I think other, you know, other countries that just aren't responsible enough to kind of you know, run the place properly will eventually dollarize. And I think, you know, Bitcoin's a great, uh, a great way out. Just going back to one of the other points and another pushback I get from, from my colleagues is the price is very volatile of Bitcoin. You know, how can you hold something that in one year is, is you know, 60,000, then it goes down to 26 and then there's a scandal and it goes down to 16 mm -hmm. and then it recovers back to 30. Um, that's a very common response that I get. You know, and my only answer is that it's still early. And although it is very volatile, the overall trend is up. You know, if you zoom out, you definitely see an uphill, an up, mm -hmm. an uptrend. But if you zoom out on Fed countries, you see a very steady downtrend. 
Um, and it's, you know, it's like, which side of that equation do you want to be on? Absolutely. When in doubt, zoom out. Okay. Well, I want yeah. to end this on, on a positive note because this has been such a, such an inspiring conversation. Anything else you want to share with, with folks out there? And I'm sure a lot of people will now be Googling how they can get their own fiat currencies. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's it. I think, you know, some people, Bitcoin turns them on because they love the payment side of it. Some of them love the freedom side of it. Some of them love the hard asset side of it. Some of them love the tech side of it. And I think, I think there's a lot of fun that can be had. You know, you can collect, you can collect coins, you can collect notes and it's, it's a journey, you know, and, and both, I mean, I didn't tell you, but both the coins and the notes to get them into the country was a whole mission. You know, I needed right. to get a permit. I needed to get a permit for bismuth for one ounce of bismuth. I needed a permit for some reason. And then wow. getting the notes into the country is not so easy because couriers are not allowed to carry currency. They're not allowed to carry money. And I try to explain to them that like, this is not money. This once upon a time was money, but it is no money. It is not money now. It's just like a collector's item, but they wouldn't do it. So, so all, all the money that I got into the country, it had to be via a friend who was visiting the States or a friend who was visiting Israel or a friend who was visiting the UK who could bring it back for me. So, but my message is, is, you, know, you can have fun with this stuff. You know, you don't have to get serious. You can have a lot of fun, you know, and you can turn it into a work of art, you know, and you can use the fun and the art to teach the kids about, you know, about Bitcoin and their future. Completely. So that's my parting message. Well, I love it. I love it. It's been really fun talking to you. I'm Nan Meltzer joining us from Cape Town. I'm sure people will want to connect with you. So I'll put your information in the show notes. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to join Coin Stories. Thank you, Natalie. And finally, this show is also made possible by iTrust Capital. iTrust lets you invest in Bitcoin for your retirement with the tax benefits of an IRA. You can defer taxes on gains using a crypto IRA or with a Roth IRA, you can withdraw tax-free at retirement. And here are some important things to know. iTrust does not lend against client assets. iTrust accounts are also FDIC insured up to 250,000 US dollars. So if you're doing retirement planning and considering adding Bitcoin to your portfolio, you can sign up for an account and get a $100 bonus at itrust.capital slash Natalie Brunel. Thank you so much for checking out the video version of my show. If you want to see more of this type of content, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and hit that like button as well as notifications. I'm always open to feedback and guest suggestions, so please email me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Thanks so much again for being part of this conversation, and I'll see you next time.